Our world is changing. From the pandemic, to social unrest, to wars, division, and climate change. It's time to envision a new way of living in and surviving the shift of ages. The Hopi call this the time of the great purification and talk about different worlds. Their petroglyphs and the other petroglyphs around the world tell the story of what happens during the shift, the geomagnetic pole shift. Learn what the indigenous peoples of the world, scientists, researchers, prophets, psychics, remote viewers, and more say about what our Earth may experience in most of our lifetimes. Learn what we can do to prepare for what might be coming in a matter of decades. Are you brave enough to envision a new Earth? Welcome everybody to today's Envisioning a New Earth show. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. I am your host, Joan Serio, and today I have with me a longtime researcher and co-author of the book, Hidden Energy, Tesla-Inspired Inventors and a Mindful Path to Energy Abundance, Gene Manning. Gene is going to share with us today the types of new energy sources that collectively and individually will help us to get to become energy self-sufficient and off the grid. Welcome to the show, Jean. Thank you, Joan. I'm just really happy to be on your show again. I'm happy to see you again, Jean. You were on um, Earth Energy Forecast with me before, so it's great to have you back here. So I think it'd be great to start with having you share with everybody how you got involved in the field of energy. Why, why did that pique your interest? I came from several uh, points of view at this. One of them was looking for some generator that uh, would be quiet and, and non-polluting that I could live out beyond the power line. That was a phase I was going through at the time. And I must say that this is a 40 year anniversary of, of the time that I actually met an inventor that had told me about these possibilities. So there was the curiosity, my endless curiosity, wanting to understand an interesting field that has such implications for the future of humankind. Um, possibility of clean energy abundance would definitely affect our quality of life on the planet. And also there seemed to be a tie in between if we understood this emerging science, this um, emerging physics, that perhaps more people would realize our interconnectedness, the interconnectedness of all life, that we're all in this sea of energy together and what we do affects affects the other person too. So there were a lot of um, strong reasons and I just couldn't understand why not more people were interested. There were a lot of technical people that were writing technical books for a technical audience about the non-conventional energy technologies, but uh, nobody writing for the general public. So I took that as my job <laughs> and traveled to conferences on several continents, um, sometimes had my way paid if they asked me to speak after, a, <clears throat> after my first book came out. So this is, this is actually also a 25 year anniversary for me of the year 1996 when my first book came out, The Coming Energy Revolution, buried down on the right side of the pile of books. So, uh, 2021 is an auspicious year for me, and I'm kind of summing up for you um, the reasons. I don't need to tell you, Joan, that um, we need a, a shift in the way that we um, distribute and, and uh, generate energy on this planet. And you can probably picture various aspects of the brighter future that we can create. So that's kind of the outline of, of the talk today will be some some of the breakthrough categories and why they don't break laws of physics. And what's most important to me is the role of consciousness in future energy. And sometimes I speak out and it's just something that is at the basis of what I, my interest is, but I forget to say it. 
So um, slow me down if I if I get uh, too deep into the technical parts of the inventions. Okay, and, Jean, will do. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so today um, we're we're not exactly in harmony with nature. One of the chapters of Hidden Energy is about the Austrian forester Victor Schauberger learning to have inventions that are in harmony with nature. Uh, based on the nature's implosive inward spiraling movements rather than the explosive movements that we use in our technologies of splitting the atom or burning fuels or uh, in, in modern times, the push to more nuclear power uh, that, that again is dealing with the radiative, radiative side of, of nature's movements, the breakdown and destruction side. Schauberger predicted that uh, well, he, he was, I think he died in the 1958s and he predicted what we would have right now, which uh, is a lot of environmental destruction from too much explosion based technology. So our choice of energy technology really messed things up. This picture is um, about a different type of radiation found it online. It's supposed to represent the uh, uh, electrosmog. Um, Schauberg also said that if, if um, we're really that imbalanced in our technologies, that the natural world would degenerate and people might morally degenerate along with it. That's interesting. Yeah, interesting to think about. Yeah. So today um, we get electric power from, if you look at the ancient um, elements, um, way of looking at things, earth, water, fire, and air. But what if, uh, and this is um, from my friend Toby Groats, these categories of um, Earth having uh, the fuels burning, and, and actually there's one Earth-based uh, technology, geothermal is, is good in small, small is beautiful aspects, like uh, your own, if you can build a home that has uh, geothermal. And water, um, I'm... Uh, really upset about the dams that are being built and damming up peaceful valleys to uh, for hydroelectric. It's unnecessary. There's small is beautiful possibilities for water. We'll, we'll get to that with uh, a water-based uh, combustion. Well, not combustion, but it's a water-based process for running generators and cars. Um, fire, uh, we look at solar as, as a clean energy, but when it's in large scale covering miles or acres of land, that's not the best harmony with nature. The same with large scale windmills. I could talk for an hour about uh, what's going wrong, but what could go right is if we responsibly tapped into the background energy of the universe, which we will be talking about today. Um, there are various names from ancient times to now for that background energy of the universe. And I- So that background to... energy, um, you're talking about, could that be life force energy? Yes, that's, that's, that's an aspect Solar of Solar energy? Um, well, there's a new way of looking at the sun that seems to be emerging that uh, it's not a, a nuclear furnace. It's, it's, it's actually um, to do with the electric universe theory or... or Plasma more, universe? Yeah, and, and, a, mm -hmm. and a, you know, some, some are saying that it's a transducer of etheric energy, but we're we're pretty far from, from uh, being able to prove that. <laughs> but whatever, it's, uh, we'll be talking about an experience, an uh, experiment that shows what might be going on in the sun is, is different than what we're told. Okay. Uh, I, I keep stressing the word responsibly because um, we could build this beautiful civilization, have um, food growing lands and still take care of people's needs if we had a source of clean, abundant power, and it's possible. Um, this is the Peace River Valley in British Columbia, and it's slated to be flooded for 
a power dam. It actually oh, could be growing, beautiful. growing food. It is, yes, a microclimate that, that has fertile soils. And the only reason it's not growing food right now is because the people who are landowners know that it's doomed to be flooded. And that makes me very sad. But um, what could we do with, um, for instance, the new, new materials that are possible? Some of the uh, inventions that I'm going to mention show that there's transmutation of elements, uh, like Dr. Randall Mills uh, finding that there's new molecules created when he's um, using his plasma-based system. Um, so the possibilities for um, strong building materials that are also lightweight and translucent, that's, that's a possibility. What could we do with that to create beauty? Beauty, beauty is so much more important than some of the values that our civilization is, seems to be hooked into right now. The, yeah, that's one thing we lost <laughs> along the way. Yeah, and and uh, this this these last couple of pictures come from uh, um, the sci-fi genre on um, solar punk, which is hmm. um, you know instead of cyberpunk, this is this is people who are tired of doomsday scenarios and, the, and they're saying, well, let's imagine what could be. Uh, they've just been thinking about uh, mainly solar power, but um, I'd like to think that some will have uh, architect and art that's uh, ether punk. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, again, this is where we're at right now is that where everyone is worshiping billionaires and um, we have Elon Musk planning to um, have a, elevate his car with the Jetsons. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that rocket power is really an enlightened source. Um, and actually his, um, you know, rocket man, <laughs> Musk, his roadster is um, powered by a motor that uses Nikola Tesla's 19th century invention instead of Nikola Tesla's later, later inventions. So what could we use for propulsion instead of rockets? Um, this scientist um, had to write under the title Rho Sigma because he was working for NASA and NASA chided him for discussing taboo topics. And he, he told mm. me he was called on the carpet and reprimanded, you know, your file shows you've been writing articles of, critical of, of our science. So we had to write a book under a pseudonym. But um, he gave examples of um, experiments that point to characteristics of the ether as a universal cosmic pre-atomic force. And he said, there are indeed vibrations or energies which have distinctly different properties from those of the electromagnetic spectrum. So maybe it's not even extremely high frequency, but maybe on another spectrum. Uh, and as, as you mentioned, the life force um, energy has also been called prana. Prana, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Orgone energy, you've heard of Wilhelm Reich's uh, experiments. Um, and ether. What is biocosmic energy? Um, well, I think that the leading edge biophysicists might be using that term for the life force in our bodies or in living systems. And how that's <laughs> intertwined with cosmic energy? Right. There's a um, biophysicist Beverly Rubick, which I, who I hope that you get on your show sometime because she can talk about the ether. She can talk about serious science experiments. She can talk about the life force. Um, it, and she works in a very, uh, you know, rigorous, with very rigorous uh, science experiments. She and her partner, who's another PhD. So um, there's, there was a Nobel laureate, Robert Laughlin, who um, in his book, A Different Universe, said that the modern concept of the vacuum of space confirmed by every day by experiment it is a relativistic ether, but we do not call it an ether because using that word ether is taboo. <laughs> I, love, 
love this cartoon because you know we have to lighten up <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. yeah the science it's gotta it's gotta fit the scientific model mm -hmm. and and i really have met mavericks of science who had their hands slapped for talking about taboo subjects but meanwhile uh in the so-called black budget world mm -hmm. Paul LaViolette is a physicist who, another great interview for you, who um, tells it like it is because he's never been um, bought out <laughs> and he's in, been independent all these years. So in, in his books, he writes that highly classified black budget programs embrace the concept of an ether um, to understand the gravity defying technologies they've been developing. He says they have no obligation to please the academic physics establishment, which still teaches the rocket principle of, as the ultimate. And I remember um, at one of the conferences in Europe, I met uh, a fairly famous scientist, Jean-Pierre Vigier. He's passed on now, but when he would come to the U.S., he would really be um, dated and, and uh, now they would take him around and probably took him on, on flights of their advanced aircraft, I don't know. But any, anyway, he told me that um, the NASA scientists told him that they use mathematics that they aren't telling the academics about. So that mm. really oh, well, struck me as interesting. Um, Dr. Laviolette uh, gave a talk recently about um, this PAIS patent. I think it's just P-A-I-A-S. P-A-I-S, um, which um, Salvador Cesar Piaz is a civilian contractor. He, he works for the uh, military industrial establishment um, and particularly has worked for the Navy. And he, uh, you can look up the patents and see that they're actually talking about um, these principles of quantum um well like his, his high frequency gravitational wave generator um which can be part of a system of patents that he can create uh he says that explain how to create a, a spacecraft that could uh, accelerate phenomenally fast and and uh turn at right angles phenomenally fast uh, without the inertial forces um, making it impossible and all these far out possibilities. Kind of like a flying saucer that, you know, some people that have seen UFOs talk about. I noticed the shape of that looks, this, yes, looks like it. Yes, the, the shape of, of uh, different um, drawings in these different patents. Um, and he uses terms in the patent. I mean, I read the patent applications and, and I, you know, I'm really geeking out here, but he used terms like uh, simultaneous, simultaneous coupling of hyperfrequency gyrational uh, forces and um, hyperfrequency vibrational electrodynamics um, conducive to a possible physical breakthrough using the, and get this, quantum vacuum plasma as an energy source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, which no secret some now. people might call the ether. <laughs> right. Uh -huh. So it's, 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 it's really no secret to many people on the planet, but not to them, not to the general public. The general public is kind of la 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 uh, that all this uh, is possible. Why um, has this been squelched, this information uh, from being studied more in mainstream science and, and shared with the general public? I've been writing about that ever since the coming energy revolution, that there are different reasons. There are vested interests. That's very obvious that um, Wall Street benefits from um, utility companies borrowing from Wall Street, and and then they're you know Wall Street doesn't intend to have um, stranded assets or whatever they're called. 
Um, so there's the financial, and and then there's even even the academic establishment resisting change because a lot of experts of the day would um, be shown as kind of having missed something important, and that's you know they're they're feeling that that their their ego, <laughs> yeah. and and yeah. uh, you know maybe they feel they wouldn't be able to pay their mortgage if if uh, they weren't yeah. as important anymore or. Um, but but there are um, PhD scientists that are, who are showing up at the conferences that, um, for example, in um, North Idaho of all places, in, in Hayden, Idaho, for more than the past 10 years, uh, there's been a series of conferences that I went to, except this last summer when I wasn't allowed to cross the border because of, right. because of yeah, the pandemic, uh, yeah. And uh, so it's called the Energy Science and Technology Conference. And I'm gonna be um, reporting more on those on my blog, janemanning.com. Um, I've already written about it, um, you know, a couple of developments out of those conferences. And there's another one coming up this summer where um, I know that one of the speakers is gonna be one of the you know, leading experimenters in this magnetic field. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll uh, try to interview him ahead of time um, and uh, keep people up on 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 those um, developments. So it's, it's the independence, the people that are um, independent, often the um, people who with the PhDs who show up at the non-conventional energy technologies is because they're <laughs> they're retired or else that they have such uh, tenure that they can um, Take the risk of, of uh, ridicule from their colleagues, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or yeah. or they work for um, military industrial complex or somebody who um, is willing to admit that these possibilities are are being explored. So I'll um, go through some of the categories. Um, I'm. You know, because it was the first invention that I saw, I'm, I'm really keen on the magnetic approach because it's more a possibility of empowerment to the people. Um, something that could be built in somebody's garage is, is a lot more empowering than something that requires a, a big plasma lab. Um, and also the solid state um, resonant circuits, that's, that's very promising because um, Sure, it takes expertise, but it doesn't take a lot of material. And uh, there are a lot of uh, electronics um, trained people out there who, uh, if they're given, given these possibilities and th they would start thinking along lines of possibilities like resonant circuits. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of whip through uh, first in the magnetism ca category, um, it was interesting showing synchronicities, like ideas coming to different people who are widely separated geographically at the same time. If there are people who have, have spent decades mulling over the possibilities and trying to figure them out, they've kind of uh, paid their dues and earned, and earned the aha moments that they get in a dream or or just um mm -hmm. some, seeing something on the workbench so this jim Mer jim murray when he met um paul babcock at one of the energy science and technology conferences paul lives in the spokane washington area and and jim at that time was living in oklahoma and it turned out that they had both envisioned and built um toroil um device that had a lot in common with each other. That was cool. And um, going to India. So, I mean, so yes, go, well, going back to that previous slide, mm -hmm. Jean, so what they're using is um, a coil of wires, and then they have a magnet that they're passing through it. Is that what they're doing? Uh, well, well, gems might be a lot more electromagnetism happening. So I'm going to go on to ones that I'm a little bit more um, up on exactly what's going on in the side. Okay. okay. Yeah. Whereas I know that uh, Paul Babcock was definitely using the powerful permanent magnets. Like 
as was as um, Paramahamsa Tuari in India. And uh, another way that people get their aha moments is, is their spiritual studies. Right. Uh, Tuari, while he was um, project director of a nuclear power plant, he had not, in his spare time was studying the ancient Vedic texts and thinking for many years about um, what might be going on in the universe. He came up with a new theory um, as a result of his studies. And then as being a scientist, he tested out his theory with experiments. So his conclusion about where the extra energy came from, comes from in, in, in this uh, space power generator, as he called it, is that space is more fundamental than matter. And I said that the real universe is the opposite of the standard concepts. Um, Toby Groats on, on the left there is an engineer from the US who traveled to Indi India. And um, his first trip to India was paid for. Uh, Toby was uh, paid before some conference to travel the world and, and look at uh, some of the best inventions happening then. And he decided that uh, Tawari's was kind of the best that he was seeing. So he went back repeatedly to help uh, when, when it needed to be testing. And that was one of, uh, that's one of Toby's specialties is having the test instruments. And he and also other, another independent, uh, a, a motor company in India that whose engineers tested out Tuari's invention said that yes, it's operating at what's called over unity. That means more power out than, than the operator put in it. Put in, which doesn't, yeah. doesn't mean that it's violating laws of physics if, if at some point uh, that um, it's tapping into the background energy of the universe. Uh, wow. what, and these inventors just describe what they're doing as working in open system physics rather than the closed system physics that um, has been the only one talked about ever since the steam engine. Mm -hmm. You know, with a steam engine, you can put it all in a box and measure exactly what was going in and what, exactly what was going out. Um, whereas um, solar power and wind power, they're open systems because they're drawing in energy from the environment. And it's pretty hard to measure exactly how much is going in. You just know that uh, that you're getting out more electricity than what you put in to, to uh, keep it running. I think this was Tavari's description of the ether, and it's pretty technical. I don't know if your listeners are all well, interested in the properties of, of the ether. And again, it's one, one, one scientist's theory, not necessarily everybody's, but its uh, description is a non-material, continuous and incompressible fluid type lacking any known property of matter. Hmm. Which, it, it was interesting. So how um, do you harness that? Uh, there's, <laughs> that's all the theories that are being developed with, with all these different categories that I'll show you. Um, I don't know anybody, well, I know people who are confident that they've got the answer, but it doesn't mean that, that everybody in the field is confident that that one person has, has the theory that it describes that there's just multiple theories. So what it is, is um, an emerging science, uh, a science that's kind of in its in its infancy, and because it isn't getting mainstream uh, interest or funding, it's uh, people funding their own work and coming up with their own descriptions of what's going on. Um, so every category that, that, that I mentioned, there's not um, a general agreement of all the scientists that, yeah, this is how we're tapping into the energy. I mean, there's um, like with the anomalous, um, energy that comes in in certain battery charging technologies like um, um, John Bedini did, 
um, you know, could just be described as collapsing charges, collapsing fields, or um, he, he would say that a certain point, um, energy comes rushing in to the system and it doesn't show up on, on the test instruments actually when it's coming in, it shows up in the total um, output of the system is more than the input. Um, in other words, um, charging batteries in parallel at the same time as, as the um, generator charging them is also doing mechanical work to um, run a load. And then it can um, use the charged batteries to feed back in to keep it going. And I'll, I'll get to, to more of that in, in a minute. Um, I, I just read a, a really sweet little book called Ether Flows by Daniel Patusi. I think I mentioned to you, to you uh, Joan. Mm -hmm. And I want to read a quote from his book. Everything is made of the ether and everything is interconnected by the ether. All that we see and feel is really an infinite variety of complex flow patterns of the ether, swirling and combining with other flow patterns to fill the universe. So <clears throat> the question, do magnets interact with that sea of energy? Things kind of changed about the time that I got into this because the first inventor that I met was just discovering the new rare earth magnets that were just coming out at that time in the early 80s. Um, the first the Sumerian iron cobalt and the, then the neodymium iron, uh, neodymium magnets are super powerful. And so he was saying, well, what could we do with this? And he tried different experiments and he, 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 he found, this is, this is not the person in the picture. This is the person in the picture is Al, Al Bunker, but um, I'm talking about Bill Muller. Um, and so he tried different experiments and he concluded that magnets can do work. And that goes against the physics books of the time. And I think they're still saying that magnets can't do work. But um, look at this, the rectangle that he's holding is, is a rare earth magnet, very small, you know, like a cubic inch. <clears throat> and then there's a, a steely between it and a heavy, maybe nine pound iron ball. And it'll, it'll keep on doing work. It'll keep on holding, I mean, lifting something is doing mm -hmm. work. Right, yeah. Yeah. So unless the magnet is, is dropped and shattered or else subjected to really high temperatures, who knows how many years it'll just continue. It'll do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, that's Bill Muller's uh, machine on the right with his, his daughter driving it. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I came in and uh, fascinated by the possibilities there. Um, there, there are other inventions that um, are coming out these days. You can look up, look up, for example, one, one is called the Earth Engine. And the de inventor describes that as propelled by asymmetrical magnetic propulsion. In other words, he has magnets that um, have different effects depending on which way they're pointing. And that creates the imbalance in the machine that makes the rotor move. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so these sorts of things, um, this is what I've been waiting for for 25 years to actually be able to um, have in our homes. And something that works 25 hours a day, 365 days a year. And you don't and, have to pay for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally independent of the power grid. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I have seen uh, other models. So typically you see an electric motor that runs and gets the magnetic generator up to speed. And then after the generator gets up to speed, then uh, typically the inventor, aha, look at me, disconnect the motor from the battery or, or pull the plug out of the wall and, and watch the generator running lights or a fan or a space heater or some electrical load. 
But what they have, just like um, the 25 year old uh, invention there, is a prototype. It's just a starting point for engineering your product. Mm-hmm. That's when typically, yeah. typically they have to scale it up. Yeah. Yeah. But that's then the expensive, really expensive part starts. I mean, these inventors have already spent all their money on, on machining and magnets and blowing up uh, transistors and, and uh, trying another model, building another prototype and borrowing money from their friends to build yet another prototype. And then when they figure they've, they've got a, a good starting point for a commercial product, they need a team uh, and, and that to, to be able to refine it into something that's a reliable commercial product. You know, looks sexy and, and is you know small and yet power dense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that's that's when they run into the problems of uh, what they find the sharks out there who come and say that uh, they'll invest. And uh, sometimes the inventors find themselves in financial trouble because of those business deals. But anyway, my point is that um, throughout history, there are examples of successful demonstrations of these magnet related motor generators and and viewed by credible witnesses. There was uh, Hans Kohler um, many decades ago, I guess maybe back when World War II time, but the uh, British uh, military wrote up uh, a report about that. There was T. Henry Moray in in Utah many years ago was his uh, invention was witnessed by Credible witnesses, um, and their stories just seem to end badly. But um, like I say, I'm writing uh, some blog posts about these possibilities that uh, uh, are happening at the Energy Science and Technology Conferences, and I particularly like to quote the man who's looking at his slide there. Uh, the, the man in the slide is, or in the picture, is uh, John Bedini with the black, with the plaid shirt at one of our conferences. But um, giving the talk about what John had done is uh, Peter Lindemann. And and Joan, if we can take a minute at this point to talk about the um, more spiritual messages, I'd like to quote Peter Lindemann. Will that work? Sure, and then we can briefly go over your other um, right, energy right, right. types of right. machines and all. I just think this is uh, so important because he's been following this for decades and well longer than anybody I know, longer than I have, and has seen a lot come and go and is, is a fairly wise person. Um, and he notices that, that some of the cutting edge inventors are receiving messages from a dimension that isn't physically visible, whether they recognize it or not. And um, Peter says, all knowledge that moves civilization forward comes from this place. We need to attune ourselves to being interested in in receiving this. And this goes for everybody in every artistic or or creative Mm -hmm, field. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And attuning ourselves to acting, acting on our emerging ability to know. And he, he commented on you know, something that that, um, that you talk a lot about, I, uh, the awakening times that we're in. And he said, we are waking up, we're becoming more conscious of a higher dimensionality of ourselves. So he's, he's um, talking to the inventors, but like I say, he could be talking to all creative people that part of the process of bringing the world to a readiness for this energy technology has to do with this awakening within us. Now, we won't particularly end up functioning any differently, but we will recognize ourselves and accept ourselves in our higher vision, higher vision of our abilities and our willingness to do it. And we will do it more consciously. And I see that happening. Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, another word for ether could be the unified field of energy. And um, I truly believe that we are a part of it. It flows through us. So we're not separate from it. 
And I think that's where all the information comes from. So when you realize that and open to that, then. Yes, yeah. you nailed it. <laughs> Download the information and all goes through the heart first though. Gotta go through the heart first. Exactly. Oh, you've written books about that, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, John Bedini's um, and, and others have built motors that regenerate batteries and produce mechanical torque. This is just a little demonstration. Uh, this isn't um, something that John Bedini had, had built, but this is, was Peter Lindemann's demonstration of, of some technical aspects of it. Um, and, and I have a friend who had to seriously um, figure out how to power his homestead as he and his wife refused the uh, utility company's smart meter because um, Al is electrosensitive, like some of us are, and uh, he just said no to the smart meter. So he'd already, he knew that this is coming, so he'd already um, erected this windmill on his property and, and put up some big solar panels. But um, he's combining that with, with his knowledge of, of um, the battery charging technologies you know, he's come to it from his own direction. He's not, you know, just going by John Bedini's recipe. He, he's built his own circuits. And, and uh, a lot of these, um, the principles that, that these guys are discovering are the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what, what Al was telling me recently is he's envisioning electric cars someday using technologies that, um, is regenerative. I mean, right now the car industry just has regenerative braking. You know, if you're going down a hill, you can um, charge up battery or capacitor by putting on the brakes. But he said, um, if these inventors get funded, car batteries could be charging even when vehicles are driving uphill. And then they, where they might use the new super capacitors instead of batteries for storing the power. But the possibilities are shining. <laughs> Another category is solid state. Um, this I, picture I took in, in uh, Europe many years ago, so it's, it's not exactly the latest invention, but it's just showing that, that this means um, circuits with no observable moving parts. You know, there may be electrons mm -hmm. in there, um, right. but uh, if they're using this principle of, of resonance, then um, it's possible to have more output than input. Um, now, if you want to say, is, is cause zero point energy do anything? Well, yes, this uh, academic is one of the brave ones who's dabbled in this field, although it's only the, on the nano scale, which is a billionth of, of, of the power source. Um, or in a billion uh, size scale. So he had a, a microscopic experiment, experiment um, harnessing zero point energy by the way of what are called Casimir forces. And that's um, the, as he calls it, zero point energy. He doesn't use the term ether. Many of them do not. Um, it's the forces that are pushing against parallel plates, for example, really smooth plates um, from, from the outside, push them together, that's a force. Just like with if two ships were um, side by side, the waves between them couldn't be really big waves compared to the waves on the outside. Um, so the smaller waves would be all that there were between them and that would push the, sh the shifts together by the waves coming from all directions, uh, larger waves from the outside. That's that's uh, where I can just describe that. So anyway, what, what this team at the University of Colorado at Boulder did uh, to extract energy from what Dr. Modell calls the quantum vacuum or zero point energy, is they made just a little teensy device called a uh, 
MIM, metal insulator metal uh, tunneling device. And that's kind of like capacitors in which little thin metal plates are separated by an insulator. It created an optical cavity on one side of the device. It was just only a less than a millionth of a meter. And that induced an electric current, current between the two metals the layers that they could measure without the scientists applying any electrical voltage. So that's, you know, not going to um, do much unless you um, put a, build about a thousand devices and put them together. Uh, and then you might be able to, to run some electronics. But still, it's electricity that's seemingly coming from nowhere. And it's been said to be impossible. But it's not violating any fundamental law of thermodynamics if they're tapping into a previously unrecognized source of energy like the zero point quantum fluctuations of space. I, I also mentioned under the, um, and I won't, I won't go into, into that, but there are a whole chapter in hidden energy where I wrote about the, the Manelis device, which is solid state. Um, device that was um, charging batteries for a car. Plasma, another category. Um, everybody's seen these globes and plasma in them, or there's plasma in, in outer space. And um, the, the, the whole variety in that field ranges um, like on the on the left, you've got Aaron Mirakami demonstrating something. He has a plasma spark engine, and then on the right you have uh, Dr. Kirill Chukinov and his um, ball lightning in the lab experiment. And um, one of the most uh, interesting chapters in hidden energy is about Walt Jenkins in Florida running a car on water. Um, the previous chapter in, in, in Hidden Energy, I wrote about um, Maury King's theory that um, perhaps what's going on in thunderclouds um, involves um, nanoscale droplets um, that are stable long enough for um, little miniature ball lightning or um, but there's something going on in thunderclouds that uh, explains what Walt Jenkins is doing. Because Walt Jenkins says what he's doing, running cars in water, it's not electrolysis. You know what electrolysis is, it's not that. Mm, interesting. But instead, um, there's a nanoscale plasma reaction and like Morikin theory that it's, um, tiny toroidal spinning so fast that um, it draws in the zero point energy. So we're, we're just getting near to the last category. So uh, go back to the last, yeah. So up the top, that's where you would uh, pour in the water. Um, the blue cap looks like a pipe sticking up, is that? Yes, that's that's probably where the water goes in, uh -huh. and uh, the the reaction part is the part that he doesn't show uh, transparent because he said that what's going on is so simple that uh, he showed everybody what exactly what's going on um, inside that uh, anybody could do it. So, um, Interesting. This is this is a case of a very very exciting technology that at, at the moment I uh, don't see that it's moving forward as fast as it could because he's he's trying for the big time funding because he has a wonderful ambition to um, create a big foundation to uh, help um, the world and help other inventors and he's holding out for a um, contract that would um, allow him to to have uh, part of the money going to a foundation and, and that um, he would be getting enough of the share of the 
um, proceeds from um, products that, that he would be able to do what he intends to do. Um, so I, I wrote about his experiences and encountering, encountering different uh, investor types, as you can imagine. <laughs> well, now, this is another um, very exciting plasma-based technology. Um, again, um, we're looking at um, early prototypes of what Dr. Randall Mills has created. Um, She's been around for a long time, so people criticize him for, you know, we're working on this 20 years and you've got um, people that invest a million dollars and what do we see? Well, you see a lot. You see that he has he has a big lab, he has hired a team, he has made great progress. He's taken um, many prototypes to try to figure out how to deal with an incredible amount of, um, it, the power comes out in the form of heat and brilliant light. Uh, out of this plasma reaction. And so um, that light is so brilliant that it has to be kind of um, toned down to the point where um, even the biggest uh, photovoltaics that are meant for big um, solar concentrators can work. So that's why is that one prototype there on the left has this black dome over it. Uh, and then the, then the dome heats up. Um, wow. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be on the side of the critics of Dr. Mills. He's not in just a backyard inventor. He's uh, not that I would criticize backyard inventors. It's, they're brilliant things coming out of there. But he um, because he you know gone to Harvard. Uh, his doctor is a medical doctor because he wanted to invent medical uh, inventions. But when he hmm. Experimenting with experimenting with electrolysis, but he was also um, trying to um, prove out a theory that he had based on some mathematics, and then he showed that it was possible to uh, get an anomalous amount of energy out of water. That was decades ago, and then in since then. Um, yeah, he's not just a medical doctor. He took electrical engineering at MIT. So he knows what he's doing, and um, and he has had uh, labs, um, small labs in, in universities, independent scientists here and there in the world, um, verify parts of, of his process and say, yes, um, he is doing what he's saying he's doing. His theory happens to be pretty out there. So... Um, that that doesn't impress the, the scientists <laughs> in in the, his theory, just the fact that he's talking about shrunken hydrogen atoms and, and that that turns off the other scientists. But whether or not his theory is turns out to be correct, he has given some amazing demonstrations, and I just hope that um, that he gets the amount of funding that's going to take it forward to products. This isn't going to be something that's going to be powering my home in a few years because he'll start with industrial size applications. Wow. As, as some of the others are, have keep their eye on too because they uh, it's kind of the low-hanging fruit of, of uh, a lot easier to get on the market is to um, create a solution for the problems of, of big industry and uh, or, or even um, yeah. to convert a, a power plant from, from a dirty fuel to uh, a new process. It's a lot easier than going through all the regulations to get a commercial home, home generator on the market with all the um, vested interests against it. You know, it has to go through all the approval processes for products. Yeah. Um, never mind, I, I keep in mind that if enough people knew about what's going on here, we could build a critical mass of people saying, hey, let's get on with this. Uh, vested interest is going to have to set aside, step aside, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. step aside for the sake of the rest of the planet and, and all life. <laughs> um, yeah, I envision new communities forming using this technology. Yes. 
beautiful. Me to too. Start using it, you know. Yeah, that's actually that's kind of where I came in because the reason I wanted to to live beyond the power line was because I was connecting with some idealistic people who wanted to live in an intentional community uh, in a place called Bear Valley. <laughs> um, at the time, my son wasn't ready to go uh, leave his high school and live beyond the power line, but um, I still wanted to find out if, if that was possible to have a, a generator that um, is not going to pollute the air in the valley and isn't uh, some noisy diesel diesel generator. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The last category, um, so-called cold fusion, it was misnamed in the beginning. It's just kind of, that's the name that the newspaper headlines used. And, uh, and even low energy nuclear reactions, LENR, which is being the, the name for that, this field uh, right now is, is, is not that public friendly. You know? Yeah, I wouldn't think. <laughs> no, because um, we in the public, we look at the word nuclear and, and, and I have a reaction. You know? <laughs> a nuclear reaction. <laughs> <laughs> because of, of, of things like Hanford and uh, uh, Fukushima and everything, and and even um, the so-called small modular nuclear reactors that that are the vested interest latest uh, push right now, it's it's unnecessary. Uh, it is not necessary to be using any bigging up any more um, radiating uranium, tritium, or you know, not digging up tritium, but any other materials that. Um, should should stay in the, in their service. Okay, that's my um, purchase here. Um, so this this whole field it has a history since 1989, which happens to be the year that has a, a really um, I have an ache in my heart thinking about what happened to my birthplace. I was born in Cordova, Alaska, and that's where the Exxon Valdez Mm. Oil spill happened in 1989, and, and is still uh, there's still gunk in, in the beautiful Prince William Sound that used to be pristine. So that's part of my um, motivation. Um, this is um, a promising company in that field of uh, LENR, Brilliant, Brilliant. It's a California company. You can look them up. Again, we're looking for um, more funding. Mm -hmm. They're, um, they say that they can control the process more than, than the other um, ask, um, types of LENR. So I wish them the best. And this is um, experiments that are going on. You know, I said we would get to what's going on in the sun. These uh, scientists, um, the team was led by Dr. Montgomery Shiles, Dr. Michael Claridge, and they were given the task of checking out the electric universe theory and see if there's anything to it. Um, so they were independent, you know, they weren't, um, electric universe theorists, but, but they did have funding so that they could build this um, experiment. SAFIRE stands for Stellar Atmospheric Function and Regulation Experiment. And their conclusion um, kind of fits in with what, what, what we said in Hidden Energy. We do live in an electric universe, not, not just a mere vacuum of space with bits of matter. Um, so um, one of the Thunderbolts project scientists commented on the Belt Sapphire project and said that, that it proves that the plasma physics pioneer Hans Alvin was right, that galaxies are, are an electrically powered phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, since the Sapphire experiments independently tested electric sun model, um, Thornhill says that it shows we've wasted more than 60 years 
trying to produce energy like the sun based on the unshakable belief that stars are isolated thermonuclear powered campfires in the sky. <laughs> um, and this, this uh, sort of research can, can give a more hopeful big picture to everybody, which I find inspiring. Um, so the, uh, their, their first prototype was small, it's just this, this glass dome. Um, and then they went on to, uh, with more funding, they, they built a, a large dome about six feet in diameter. And um, the, it, they were getting all sorts of energy densi densities that could be analogous to what's going on in the sun. And they were getting, um, electromagnetic confinement of matter that didn't require a big uh, iter, uh, you know, the um, big particle accelerator size experiment. And what is most interesting is that there are new elements and they were confirmed. Um, so what the, the Montgomery Childs uh, hmm. the, man standing in this picture says, uh, we think we're seeing a new phenomenon. We're calling it intense plasma flow discharge. And, and they, one of the things they saw were um, numerous rotating translucent plasma spheres going on inside this plasma. Looks like a portal. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So um, if you know, they're saying that the possibilities from this are to generate energy, produce heat, transmute elements, and possibly remediate radioactive waste. So they're raising funds to bring the commercial product to the market, but they, it's gotten kind of quiet now because they have bigger investors now. And as I hear that it, um, investors are from the Netherlands, that might be even where they're working yeah. but this, um, simple terms how this would work is a hydrogen fuel in other words water enters enters the reactor um, the power going in is electrical and then the reaction at the core generates heat which then they could create steam and run a turbine that generates electricity and they say that there are no negatives like no radioactive side effects produced. So sounds sounds really really good. Um, I can say I can't uh, really know how close they are to commercial product, but we'll keep our eye on that. I can almost to the end here. How are we doing for time? You got another eight minutes, and we got to wrap up in eight okay. minutes. So okay. Well, going back to. Um, Schauberger's words, uh, you know, Schauberger always said we had to understand nature and copy nature in our technologies. But his son, Jörg, uh, who is uh, there squatting and looking at his uh, prototype of his father's invention, said to add cooperate with nature. So comprehend nature, copy, and cooperate with nature in our technologies. Um, well, there's just so much that needs to be said about the uh, consciousness aspect. It, it's it's where it's where the rest of us um, come in. Um, how can we create that critical mass of, of consciousness that's going to going to ask for this technology? Um, I'm going to have to uh, go quickly through um, mentioning that uh, one of the chapters is about. Dr. Randy Masters and his experiments and his theories about um, conscious harmonic universe sciences. Um, so that's that's a whole field in itself. So it it uh, combines uh, the physical experiments and uh, uh, his ideas about tuning consciousness. Um, you know the music of the spheres. Mm -hmm. Part of uh, understanding this. This I just uh, yeah it, using it, light and sound. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. 
Um, Jim Murray, one of the scientists that I talk about in, in Hidden Energy, said that, um, you know, he, he'd written an essay and asked if we could quote it, that uh, humankind needs to progress beyond quantum mechanics to work with a fundamental and sublime power source. For if we desire to animate our industries with the breath of the universe, should we not first listen to the subtle whisperings which it offers to every conscious mind? And, and this is kind of his, his uh, statement to the other inventors. Mm -hmm. Before we engage in celestial mechanics, surely we must recognize the existence of a cosmic mind. Oh, Paul Babcock, another of the inventors, wrote about. Um, so my point here is that uh, these inventors aren't just all about tech. That if they work in this long enough and and really think deeply about what it is that they're playing around with, uh, they come to some pretty profound conclusions. And that's why I'd like to get this out to the to the world. Mm -hmm, because, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Conclusions they come to are really uplifting. Um, this is the very last sentences in, in Hidden Energy. What each of us can do uh, to, to look around and ask ourselves, uh, in what small alcoves of, of my life can I replace anger with love? And as a first step, um, to being the consciousness shift is to use the power of visioning, uh, and use our imagination with heartfelt gratitude. So not just with, with our minds, but bringing in our positive emotions of imagining living in a harmonious civilization on a regenerated earth. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of my slides. <laughs> Well, that was wonderful, Jean. So we have a lot to look forward to, I think. A lot of things to choose from, and I'm looking forward to that. And for anybody that's interested in more of this information, they can get your book. And uh, they can just go to jeanmanning.com to get your book, Jean. Uh, there are links. Um, Hidden Energy is for sale on, on Amazon. But um, we also link and also on hiddenenergy.org link, link to Freedom Press if you're in Canada. Uh, you might want to order from Freedom Press um, or order the um, ebook from Freedom Press. Um, and there's an audio book out now too, uh, as of earlier this year. And also um, within a few weeks, we'll have a Spanish edition, if I can pronounce the title right, uh, <laughs> Energia Universal. Well, my Spanish is pretty bad, but we certainly had a professional translator working on it. And, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, and then a couple of uh, physicists who are volunteers that uh, went through it to make sure that the technical parts were translated okay. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah, that's great. And I'm excited about all these experiments and hopefully it will get down to um, the consumer level soon and we can live uh, a much better life and help to create this new earth together. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Jean. I truly appreciate it. Well, thank you for sure spreading the word about uh, all these good news things, Joan. It's uh, you spread the word about, word about what we need to um, watch out for and, and uh, look out for in the world and, and also of uh, what we could have. Yes. And I really appreciate that. Yes. Envision a new earth. All right. Thank you so much. And if you're interested in envisioning a new earth and learning more about it, please just subscribe to Envisioning a New Earth. There's going to be much more information coming out. Just hit the subscribe button and forget, don't forget to hit the bell as well. And if you hit a like, that helps me out a lot. All right, everybody, take care. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Gene. Thank you.